<laughs> this is Frank J. Avella with Awards Daily. Today in our Oscar Legends series, we have an Academy Award nominated actress who burst onto the cinematic scene in Martin Scorsese's Goodfellas as Karen Hill, and has been doing amazing work in film and television ever since. She received four Emmy nominations for her iconic portrayal of Dr. Jennifer Melfi on HBO's The Sopranos, and in her latest film, Jasir tosses all vanity out the window and delivers a powerhouse turn as the tortured and damaged woman trapped in her own narrow-minded world in until she meets the titular character. It's a thrill for me to welcome Lorraine Bracco. Thank you, how lovely. It's very nice intro. <laughs> <laughs> Lorraine, I, there's so much to talk about, Let, but let's start with um, Jasser or Jasir, depending on who the character is who's saying it in the film. Right, that, um, was, that was me never getting it right. <laughs> You you do astonishing work in this film. Congratulations! My God, thank you. You're welcome. No, I I I mean it. Um, you're kind of a Karen. You're this angry racist conservative, and you had to go to some pretty dark places. I'm I'm curious. How did you prepare to play her? Well, I don't know. I I prepared in a in a kind of a funny way because, uh. It was during COVID and I had spent a, a, a huge amount of time by myself. And um, uh, and I, I feel that uh, I, I've been watching our country change mm. and um, uh, not that I like that, uh, but I I was watching that change and um, kind of took that to heart. Um, and I put all of my worry and concern into her. Mm. Mm. Wow. Weird. It doesn't make sense, right? It it's it's uh uh. uh not a normal way to uh, to find a character, but um, I think the alone time during COVID uh, made me think about a lot of people and things and and uh, the way this country was going. Um, that wasn't the way I felt it should go. So I kind of just went on the opposite of that. And then the whole drug addiction, booze thing is uh, is prevalent all over, yeah, all over the country. So, you know, it's so interesting you say that because Meryl's arc is pretty incredible. I mean, I wish all Karens would experience that kind of enlightenment. Um, <laughs> but here's the thing, though, um, we see her near the end, and I, I don't want to give too much away, but we realize that the person she became it isn't who she always was. So that says a lot about what you said, actually, I think, and, and how the down, downtrodden people of this country can become more narrow-minded if they feel like stomped upon. Sure. It's, look, uh, it's, I've always felt it's a very lonely world. Mm. So um, when you narrow your vision, whether it's reading or books or uh, television um, or the TikTok or Facebook, all things that I don't know, <laughs> uh, um, you're only hearing one voice. And um, I don't think Mer Meryl traveled a lot. I mean, she was very, uh, She's very racist. She uh, she hates him right away. Uh, you know, almost like he was poison to touch her cat. It's uh, it's very vis visceral for her. Yeah, yeah, and there's so much pain under all that meanness, though. Yes, but I think that always is very true. How did uh, the script come to you, Lorraine? Uh, the agent sent it to me, and um, 
uh, Wahid, first time director, the fact that he wrote it uh, uh, and is, is a lot his story. I thought it was a terrific script. I hadn't read a script like that in a long time, nor a part like that for me in a long time. So, um, uh, and during COVID and everything else, and I just said, yes, I, I want to tell this story. The story just uh, uh, spoke to me, touched me, uh, made me laugh and cry. Um, yeah, I, I loved the story. I thought it was a, a, an important story to tell today. I completely agree. And I really, I wanted to find an audience. You know, I, I've spoken to colleagues and they haven't even heard of it. So I know. I know. I've been well, trying to spread. We've had no money. We had, if I told you we were 21 people on the crew, wow. <laughs> we were no one. We, we, we had nothing. Uh, uh, we during COVID, so there was the testing all the time. I'm sure they spent more money on testing COVID than they did anything else in this movie. That's crazy. You know, I, I have to tell you, my favorite line is is um, when the cop asks Meryl, do you mind if I take a look inside? And she responds with, wipe your feet. Yes. <laughs> it she says everything. Yeah, it says everything about her character. <laughs> no, she's funny. I think she has a lot of, you know, ballsy lines and and she's uh she's something. I mean, she's out there. Yeah. And you get to sing in this and rather well. I'm awful, please. Don't even remind me. I'm awful. Yeah, well, I, I think cannot sing. And God knows I was very lucky to have uh I forgot the name of the girl who helped me. Uh, it'll come to me, but uh, also Boo, uh, who is a, he, he, he was in the uh, recording room and also he played in the band at the end with me. I mean, he's a major guy. I mean, he's worked with uh, uh, Bruno Mars and Mark Ronson. I mean, he's a, he's a incredible, uh, accomplished, <laughs> guy and i was humiliated <laughs> humiliated it was very hard for me have you seen the final film you know what why he sent me a text and asked me to watch it and i watched it this morning and uh i'll be truthful i watched the movie with tears in my eyes yeah yeah i had tears too which is very strange for me uh yeah, I thought it was lovely. And you validated yourself singing wise. I'm just going to let you know that and we'll move on. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> so before we dive into specifics of your film and TV work, I want to thank you for giving us so many strong Italian-American female portrayals, something that's too bloody rare in any medium. I agree. I agree. And one of the things I could tell you honestly is, when I met David Chase and we talked about Carmela and I turned around to David and I said, well, I don't really want to play Carmela. I would like to play Dr. Melfi because you never see a strong, intelligent Italian woman in the movies, in, in the media, anywhere, by the way, yeah, except for Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> <laughs> and look how God hated bless, she is. God bless her. Well, you know. Yeah. When you believe what you believe, you, uh, you're going to have a strong, uh, uh, strong opposition. Well, um, I have a bunch of questions about Melfi later, but uh, let's start at the beginning. You started out as a model. When did the acting bug start biting? Well, I had done a lot of commercials in France, and I was asked to do a movie in France where I played a model uh and uh, i guess you know it started there and then i i learned about this uh, uh acting class with john strasberg lee strasberg's son so i took that um and i started to you know i started to enjoy it 
And one of your first films was um, with the great Lena Vertmuller, a guy called Camorra, which I found a few copies on eBay, but they're all in Italian, which I should order anyway, because I do know Italian, but they're almost impossible to get. <laughs> well, it wasn't one of her huge movies, but yes, I, at the time, was uh, uh, with Harvey Keitel, and Harvey had a big role in it, and she saw me, and she said, you, come here, you, <laughs> bring the bambini. I had Margot with me. Oh. And uh, and she threw me in the movie. <laughs> wow. Oh, and your, your first significant role was uh, Ridley Scott's Someone to Watch Over Me. What was that experience like? Great. Yeah? Great. Well, Ridley Scott loves women. So that's uh, that's always a great thing when a director loves a loves to uh, loves a woman. It's, it was a great experience for me. He was patient. I made tons of mistakes. I knew really nothing about filmmaking. Uh, I often said to him, they didn't teach me this at the actor studio. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, continuity, things like that. Uh, yeah, I didn't know anything. But Ridley had white gloves on and was patient and loving and and allowed me to uh, to bring whatever I had on uh, in myself to that character. Oh, yeah, I thought it was a great performance. Um, and then right after that, you made a, a little film directed by Dean Pitchford called Sing, uh, which I just watched for the first time. Teresa, she's some tough teacher with some nice dance moves. I liked yes. it. Thank you. I liked making it. And it was Richard Baskin who directed it, not right. Dean. Dean right. did the music. Thank you. Thank you I for the correction. Um, I'm surprised they even remember that. <laughs> Then Karen Hill and Goodfellas, which I'm sure changed your life. Um, yeah. Now, you had already read for Scorsese for his comedy After Hours, correct? That's true. And I uh, didn't get the part. Oh. And um, uh, Marty, I have to say, very decently called me up and said, listen, I really like you. I can't give you this part. I'm on a very tight budget. I have to bring it in on time. Um, but I promise you, we will work together. So, of course, I hung up the phone. I went, oh, fuck you. you know? <laughs> Liar. That'll never happen. I was perfect for the part. You know, all the things an actor would say. But I always... Uh, have the utmost respect for Marty for calling me that that um, in spite of not giving me the part. Um, and I didn't really believe him that we would ever work together. But <laughs> uh, he proved me wrong. In the best way. Um, so did you and Marty's processes mesh right away? Or I mean, you might have still been discovering what your process was at that time. Oh, sure. Look, I had a lot of support. I had Harvey Keitel to uh, to lean on and to talk to. Uh, Robert was a friend. Um, I, and who couldn't fall in love with Ray Liotta? I don't know. I, I know I did. Um, uh, it was a very, very hard experience thrown in with the boys. And I remember always saying, you got to bring your A-game, kid. You got to bring it. Tomorrow's the day. Today's the day. Uh, and um, yeah, Marty and I clashed on some things. Uh, but I think that uh, all good directors and actors bring uh, their A-game. And it doesn't always mean it's the same A-game. That's right. Do, do you have... um? Yeah, great chemistry with Ray Liotta, by the way. It was amazing. Uh, is is there any one memory or moment that stands out for you as a favorite scene or or what you think might have been your best work in that film? Uh, I don't know. I, You know, Ray was always 
so extremely prepared every day for every scene. And I was more, I want to say loosey goosey, you know, the, the, where our marks were, uh, I ad libbed more than he did, I think. Um, uh, but Ray always brought me to a, a better level, a higher level of, of uh, who these two people were. And, and, uh, I don't know, I, anything, I, I loved working with Ray, I did. Uh, he made me better. And you had that Frankie Valley ad lib, didn't you? Yes. <laughs> wow. Which was your Oscar clip. <laughs> it was, I don't even know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, it was written uh, by who I love and adore, uh, Nick Pelleggi, it was written Rock Hudson. And I was not a, never a big fan of Rock Hudson, God bless him. Um, and also, Rock Hudson was not my generation. And whenever Marty and I would have any disagreements, it would be because I kept having to remind him, I'm still a young woman. I'm 25 years old. I'm 27 years old. I'm 30 years old. And I think that, um, <clears throat> you know, he had in his mind maybe uh, a, a different generation, mm. an older generation. And I had to fight a lot for, you know, for her that way. Well, and, so, and so there comes in uh, Frankie Valley. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's perfect. It's a I'm long way to get there, but yes. I'm sure you get asked about the Copa scene constantly. Um, my curiosity about that scene is how many takes do you, uh, can you, do you remember how many takes it might've taken to get it right? I, I'm going to say 18 only because I've been asked this a lot of times, <clears throat> but um, uh, it was an experience. It was an all day shoot. Uh, everybody was hyped up. It was, you know, uh, remembering that and God bless Ray again for pushing me to put me on my right spot, right turn, <laughs> you know, <laughs> counting the, the beats that he knew, you know, uh, Marty needed to get to the, uh, to the, uh, to the, to the chair, to Henny Youngman, you know, I, again, Ray, Ray was the leader. Mm. Wow. Did the acclaim that the film received surprise you? I don't know. I didn't really pay attention to that. I don't know. I, you mm. know, look, when I was nominated for a Golden Globe, I had to ask Harvey, what's a Golden Globe? <laughs> so I didn't know anything. It wasn't on my radar, though that's not why I studied acting or became an actor, you know, I became an actor because I thought there were stories to be told and that I felt I could do them well. Speaking of the, the awards, what was the Oscar experience like for you? Well, my father made that a lot of fun for me. <laughs> he was your date? No, uh, Harvey was my date, but my parents came and he sat behind me and he, um, <clears throat> rolled up the the uh program like he was at the racetrack <laughs> so, <laughs> so um when i lost i heard the <laughs> behind uh... me and uh you know he let out a couple of phrases that any father probably would and I looked behind him and I said, you have to be quiet. <laughs> Shut up back there. But uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was fun. Well, I agree with your father. You should have won. And I'll leave it at that. Um, after Goodfellas, you made a series of interesting choices. Uh, you worked with Blake Edwards on his late career comedy Switch, where you got to seduce Ellen Barkin, sort of. Yes, that was fun. <laughs> 
<laughs> Not every girl could do that, by the way. <laughs> And uh, Medicine Man with Sean Connery was a big hit, but not a great experience. No, sadly. I loved Sean. Sean was uh, Sean was a lot of fun. Uh, I was away for so long, four or five months, and I didn't really, really get along with uh, John McTiernan and his wife at the time who produced the movie. Um, I think John's idea of us was very much Tracy uh, 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 Hepburn kind of thing. But he made Sean the warm one and me the cold one. Mm -hmm. And I said, you, you've, you've made in the initial mistake right then and there. I could never be cold. I don't know how. Mm -hmm. uh, I am, and yes, I know it's acting, but you can't take the essence of a being uh, away in that way. Where Sean is, you know, uh, standoffish and and can play that. Yeah. Um, I sadly came up very short in that department, and. Um, and then they kept changing the script and had different writers. And I was, listen, I hadn't made enough movies and hadn't been enough around uh, the big boys. Yeah. yeah. I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. I was a, a, you know, a youngin. And, um, and I just definitely was not my way of working and, uh, it was a difficult shoot period. <laughs> well, and I'm wondering why the strong female leading roles didn't pour in after Goodfellas. Do you do you think some of that might have had to do with the fact that you you are an Italian American actress, and they were trying to typecast you, perhaps? Well, Hollywood typecast everyone, so there's there's no if ands and buts about that. Am I very urban? Yes. Am I New York? Yes. Uh, did I want to go to elocution lessons and change the way I speak? Uh, no. I felt that that would be, um, that I would be a traitor to my soul. Fair enough. Um, well, you, you made getting gaudy for TV. Can I say something? Oh, please. I felt what roles would come to me would come to me. Hmm. I never, uh, I, I, I never ran after anything. I just believed that what would be mine would be mine. That makes sense. Did, did you find yourself that you might have turned down something that you regretted turning down afterwards? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to yeah. want to share any titles? Well, there's two roles that two roles I turned down and one I didn't get. The one I didn't get, which I, you know, and I, God knows I adore her, was Working Girl. Uh, um, I would have loved that role. And she, Melanie, God bless her, I thought was fantastic in it. Um, I turned down, look who's talking. Oh, okay. Christy Alley got it and it turned out to be a huge success, but I didn't understand the script. I didn't understand the comedy, the humor of it. So that was that. And then I, I didn't do uh, my cousin Vinny. Oh, but that's okay. I, yeah. I mean, you have three great women and three great performances. So, say la vie. We all have them. That's right. That's right. And you did, again, you made Getting Gaudy for TV, where yeah. you played the real-life prosecutor, Diane Giacalone, another yeah. strong Italian-American character. Yes. Yeah, I enjoyed that. I thought it was, I thought it was, for television, it was very good. For network I television. I agree. Yeah. I agree. And then in 2005, Basketball Diaries, where that was pretty harrowing stuff. And uh, you work with a young Leo DiCaprio. And I'm, I'm curious as to what that experience was like. 
Um, <clears throat> well, when they sent me the script, it had three lines. And I was like, whoa, the fuck? <laughs> what is this? And uh, Leo and Scott got on the phone and Leo convinced me to do it. Leo said, listen, I know it's, don't, don't worry about the script. We'll make it up, we'll do it. You can say, do whatever you want. Um, but I want you to play my mom. And, and I said, okay, if you're gonna give me carte blanche, I'm in. And I think I turned those three lines into a very interesting parent uh, in that situation. And he was delicious. He was just about to become a huge star. So I got him, <laughs> I got him uh, on the way up. <laughs> yeah. uh, and um, I loved working with him because he was very committed. For, th for that, Leo reminded me, now when I look back, he reminded me of Ray Leota and he reminded me of a Jimmy Gandolfini, committed committed there every second of the of the game mm. and i loved that and we improvised a lot they let me do whatever so yeah last moments of those film of that film between you and him are devastating yeah. i agree yeah. it's supposed to be devastating yeah um, okay, let's move on to the Sopranos. Uh, oh, you... that series. <laughs> <laughs> little, little known series. I feel like I should have um, woke up this morning on a recorder here <laughs> as a lead in. Um, so you talk about how you were offered Carmela first and why you uh, well, chose. Let's put it this way. David wanted to meet me and the part that he wanted to meet me for was Carmela. And I talked him out of that. Oh, amazing. Amazing. And um, I have to tell you, I used to watch a show with my parents. I know, strange. And those therapy scenes were the most electric moments for me. It was just two people sitting, talking, and I couldn't wait for them every week. Oh, my God. That's so nice. Thank you so much. It's so true. They I were the, the heart of the, the series. I uh, you know, I remember when we finished the pilot and it was three, four o'clock in the morning somewhere in uh, Manhattan in a studio. And I said to David and Jimmy, as we were drinking champagne, that it was all over. I said, I'm really afraid that, you know, these scenes will not be interesting and that I will be the weak link in the series. I remember. Wow. So almost like, thank you so much for the pilot. <laughs> thank you. I enjoyed the work. I, I believe in her. I love her. I love their relationship. Uh, because for me, it was the most intimate he, he, he could be. And, uh, but I, I, I always felt that weak link, never going to, never going to go to first season. How did you feel as the seasons continued and you realized you weren't? <laughs> I was shocked. I was like, I can't believe America, Root and Toot in America, is going to enjoy two people sitting in a chair bullshitting. It was amazing. So much of that had to do with the power of the actors, I think. You know, it reminds me. And also the power of the word. Right, the writing, too. Um, but it reminds me of the movie Clute with Jane Fonda, where the strongest parts of that film, and it's a great film, were her therapy scenes. It's true. Yeah. They were great. Um, she was great. <laughs> oh, yeah. God. Um, Melfi, an important Italian-American character, she's smart, she's educated, she's moral to a fault. Yes. I'm curious, as the series progressed, did you feel um, 
a responsibility to keep her as ethical as possible in her choices? Did you have to fight for that? Or was it always sort of there? I told David right off the bat, if you're going to make her into the psycho killer, sex addict, blah, 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 I'm not interested in it. I'm interested because I feel that therapy uh, can help people. And I don't want to make a mockery of it. And he promised me. Um, Melfi's last scenes I want to talk about because they weren't in the finale, but they were in the penultimate episode. And I, I have to tell you, I always felt, and I still do, that just sending Tony away the way she did, it felt forced to me. It didn't feel in character with who she was. And, you know, I, I think David Chase is amazing, and I don't want to blaspheme or anything. But it felt like, okay, this is what we have to do, as opposed to this is what she would do. I agree. Really? Okay, well, and, you know, it's funny, because after I watched Employee of the Month last night, um, where you did incredible work. And you were struggling in that episode with possibly severing ties with Tony. And it was, and so it was strange for me that then all those seasons later, it would it would be revisited. And then because of this sociopath study, you know, it, it kind of, it compounded what I originally thought that, no, sorry, she had made her decision three seasons ago that she was gonna keep Tony on because they had this this bond together. Sorry, I feel really strongly about this. <laughs> Listen, you, you, just so you know, you are not alone. You are not alone in feeling very strong about that. Yes, I my goal from the get go was if he's sick, I am going to help him get better. Yeah. That is my goal. That is my job. Yeah, I agree. Uh, by the way, employee of the month. Um, wow. Uh, I, I mean, incredible work. That episode should have won you your much deserved Emmy. I know awards, whatever. I'm just saying, and I know who won, but she already had one. Uh, it it honestly should have been you. So that goes down in in the books of say la vie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, looking back on the phenomenal success of the show today, um, how, how do you, how do you look at it all these years later? Like, what what are your takes from it for you personally? I feel very lucky. I got to work with Jimmy Gandolfini and David Chase. I am grateful for that. And really nothing else matters. Yeah. So many of you did just some of the best work that's ever been done on television, and that remains. So, um, And uh, while you were doing The Sopranos, you made your Broadway debut in The Graduate, which I saw. Oh, my God. I saw Kathleen Turner, and I saw you. Oh, wow. Um, and I, I thought you were terrific and uh it's it's still your only time doing on broadway right yes. uh, what made you want to do it and why haven't you returned to theater well I, I can't answer why i haven't returned maybe because i haven't read anything i really want to do but for me <clears throat> standing in 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 a public venue i needed to get over that I needed to force myself. I was good with the camera, but I was never a good public uh, speaker person. Uh, that was never my forte. So I, I really kind of forced myself to do it. It was hard for me. Yeah. Well, what I remember thinking is you that she had you're Mrs. Robinson. There was a natural sensuality to her where it didn't need to be forced. I remember thinking that. Well, that's good. But it's not easy. It was, it's not an easy role. I think Kathleen was great at it. Um, uh, but for me, it was a very personal struggle to be in front of an audience. 
And how did you feel when the run was over? Were you um, proud of yourself for doing it? Sure. Sure. Okay. Sure. Um, so Rizzoli and Isles, uh, you, you play Angie Harmon's helicopter mom for um, every episode, I believe, in the seven seasons. I and yet some... So. Some juicy moments on that show. Uh, you know, what are your what is your takeaway from? Because that was a big part of your life, I would think. Well, I got to live in L.A. for five years, which was fun. Um, I adored Angie. I adored Sasha and and Jordan. Uh, we had a great group. Uh, um, it started off a little rocky. Uh, I will say that, and then. Um, uh, look, I was used to working with David Chase and Jimmy Gandolfini for almost 10 years, sitting in a chair. All of a sudden, I had to walk and talk. <laughs> <laughs> that was challenging. Um, and also, I it was a different kind of TV making. I was very spoiled on HBO with Sopranos. Uh, um, and this was a, uh, a eight day a week, you know, got to get it done kind of thing. So, uh, that took time for me to kind of get used to that. Um, but I adored Angie, Sasha, Jordan, um, uh, Brian Goodman. I mean, I, and, and, and what's his name? Uh, Bruce McGill. I loved them. I, I enjoyed them uh, every day. That's fantastic. Um, before we get to Sicily, I just want to mention um, the birthday cake, which yes. uh, you have a really meaty scene at the beginning and then you disappear. And I'm like, where the hell's Lorraine? Where, where is she? And then we find out the shocker, you, you, you end up murdering everybody, basically. <laughs> yeah, it's a part of me. <laughs> but what a fun was... role. Was it Was it fun to, to shoot? Oh, it was great. It was great. It was a lot of fun to work on. Um, I loved everybody there. Uh, it was great. I enjoyed it. I like to work. I like to work. Work is interesting to me. I mean, once I decide to go, I'm going. Let's put it that way. That's awesome. Um, so you bought a house in Sicily recently for one euro. And, and I got I, to... I bought uh, two walls <laughs> and a floor. Yes. That's what I really bought. And HGTV shot it. And it's my big Italian adventure. And it is so much fun. Um Good. I'm Sicilian, so, you know, it was especially from, fun. From where? Marineo. It's about 30 minutes outside of Palermo. Okay. So my house is 50 minutes south oh, of okay. Palermo. We're not that far from one another, then. That's interesting. No, I would think not. Sambuca. I no, Sicily. You'd be surprised. Um, I'm curious. I have to ask, did, did H? GTV or the town of Sambuca help you in any way to pay for what came close to what 200 grand that you had to shell out for this? Yeah, perhaps more, but uh, you know, look, uh, HGV, yes, helped me with all the paperwork, uh, finding the people to, to uh, uh, the contractors, the, uh, uh, the permits, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So yes, they did help me. They were very kind. They paid for my flights back and forth, which was great. Nice. Um, yeah, it, listen, it was a hell of an experience. <laughs> I, I think, you know, it's like these three episodes that we watch, but I'm sure you went through it for what? Oh. Ye over a year, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How but often... Go ahead. I've been there a couple of times. Well, COVID, I finished it right before COVID. Okay. I was supposed to return in, in March. And my, my daughter, Stella, said, no, you are not going anywhere because of COVID. Um, and so 
They made me cancel my trip. So it wasn't for two and a half years. I didn't go back. And now I've been back three, four times. Nice. And, and do you feel do you feel like it's home there for you or a second home? I mean, New York is your home. Listen, it's very special. It's a you know, it's a, uh, it's an amazing little town with beautiful people who uh, who are happy to see me when I come. <laughs> That's great. Um, can I come visit you when I'm there? <laughs> <laughs> Um, Lorraine, I'm not going to keep you much longer. It's been such a joy talking to you. Um, do you think the industry has changed regarding telling stories that involve women over over 40, over 50? Well, I'm sure we could say that from the get-go that, uh, you know, over 40, you were dead. But um, <clears throat> look, uh, <clears throat> I can only say I've been really very, very lucky. Jassir came around. Uh, I have a series in England that um, that I absolutely adored uh, um, uh, called Jerk. I play a, uh, a young man who has cerebral palsy, who's a comedian, and um, and I play his crazy mother, and it's like the third or fourth season. So I was just in London. He's American, but he lives in England. Uh, and that was a, it's been a great experience for me. Um, I, Jassir came around, jerks come around. They've got a bunch of things down the road that could be really fantastic. I'm working right now in, uh, in Spain with, uh, <clears throat> with a, 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 a Spanish director, uh, which is a terrific script. It's called uh, Rich Flu. And uh, I, I, I have to say, you know, there are periods, COVID, you know, was slow for, I think, everybody. But um, since then, I, I mean, things have been coming in and, and interesting. Uh, um, I mean, I, I, I have nothing to complain about, really. You keep working, and that's what's important. I feel very lucky. <laughs> well, you know what? We're the lucky ones because we get to see you on the big and the small screen all the time. And it just, you know, it gives me a special joy um, because, you know, I, I, I think you're really, really talented. And, and your work has, has meant a great deal to me as an Italian American as well. Um, My father would be proud. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope people seek out Jasir. I would, oh, um, yeah, I, is, is it, is there, um, I know it's going to be playing in Sundance. Is there some type of, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, they're uh, they have a special screening. They told me about. Um, I think it's January twenty third. They're they're doing something special there. Yeah, how fabulous! Well, it is on the Academy screening room, which is I think great, with one hundred and eighty one other movies. Um, <laughs> it's getting them but, to watch it. You know, I think if they watch I hope, it, I know, I get it. You know, we had no money to make it, so I, I there's there's been no money to really uh you know make a a a a go of it in a, a publicity department as we know that's uh, a lot of this uh movie making is about um but you know what wahid i'm very proud of this movie uh malik i think is absolutely fantastic yes oh, yes god he is great um I, I loved watching him work. Uh, we had good rehearsals, uh, very prepared. Again, very committed. I love an actor who's committed like that. Um, and this way I just dance around, which is funny. It's, uh, I don't know why, but yeah. And the chemistry of the two of you, you talk about chemistry, the chemistry of the two of you have together is, is palpable. It's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Lahid, uh, you know, 
God bless them. I'm telling you with $2 and 50 cents, God bless them. Well, I want to, I want to thank you for taking the time out um, to spend with us today. And uh, I look forward to what you um, do in the future. Thank you so much, Lorraine. Thank you so much. This was pleasant. Thank you. Thank you.